health and hip hop power couple who have been together and inspiring others and each other for over 23 years. This husband and wife team founded the holistic wellness brand, RBG Fit Club. Afia holds a bachelor's degree in nutrition and is certified in holistic health. She's also an author of two award-winning cookbooks, The Vegan Soul Food Guide to the Galaxy and The Vegan Remix. Stick, aka Stickman, a renowned rap group, Dead Press, is an award-winning, yes, you are in the right place is an award-winning hip-hop artist and producer, author, certified long-distance running coach, and creator of a new music genre dubbed Fit Hop. Stick is also the CEO of the first ever music label dedicated to healthy living, RBG Fit Records. Together, Stick and Afia are down-to-earth, charismatic, and inspiring tag team encouraging holistic, healthy living in authentic, relatable, and creative ways. The couple lives here in Atlanta. Here in Atlanta. With their two gorgeous sons. I'll take this opportunity to just say, uh, let's give y'all a little insight on what RBG Fit Club is, because a lot of times people ask and not really sure. And so, uh, RBG Fit Club is a, is a movement that we started uh, RBG reaching bigger goals um, but it came out of red black and green rice beans and gravy and all that good stuff um, we, it's founded in our family's principles of holistic living and uh, we, we chose five basic principles uh, to organize that platform around so it's knowledge nutrition exercise rest and consistency. And so all the work that we do is centered in those principles in different ways. And we use uh, hip hop culture fused with holistic health to do that work. So uh, we got an online website, rbgfitclub.com, and we just keep just creating different ways to make that, that fusion, you know, of the two worlds, hip hop and holistic health. And yeah, it looks something like that. Um, so yeah, um, how you want to get started, man? Um, I was waiting on the cooking. Are y'all gonna do it for us? Yeah, we got you. We got you. You got it. We, I, I take it. I got you. Okay, so we'll just say next slide. All right. Yeah. 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 So a couple years ago, maybe two years ago, uh, we wrote this article. We partnered with our our friend Tony from PlantBasedOnABudget.com, by the way, that's a that's a major key, as Colin would say. Um, uh, PlantBasedOnABudget.com, and we wrote an article called "How to Eat Good on a Hood Budget: Seven Ways," and um, it, it it went viral. You know what I mean? Like, and uh, we ended up on a whole bunch of circuits because of that article, because that's an issue, you know, in in this culture. Uh, of everybody having access, you know, to healthier, more sustainable ways of living, right? And so um, we shared our insight from being in this uh, culture for a while, and uh, it was not without some criticism too. But we'll get into that. But I, I want to feel maybe to start with what we mean by eating good, and then I'll talk about the hood budget part. So uh, what we mean by eating good is course a healthy plant-based diet and so what we mean by plant-based that encompasses vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, so at least 90% of your food should be coming from a plant-based so that's what we mean by eating good and um, also organic as much as possible when possible and then the most nutrient-dense foods that you can have so you can be at your best. That's what we mean by eating good. Whole foods, yeah. not a lot of processed foods, organic, and plant-based. And then hood budget. Um, I ain't really got to even explain that, but, um, but, but it's important, a, a important point I want to make about hood budget, because 
we can assume that means you know so we, we not much money, right? First one but I like to look at it in a more positive way. Like you know, money is one resource, but it's not the only resource, right? And in the hood, you know, we got mo many more resources than just money, because some we might not have money, but we have resources of our neighborhood, of our time, our organization, our innovation. You know what I mean? Our hustle. All of those are, are resources. So when we talk about eating good on a hood budget, we, we really are talking about um, use, utilizing all the resources we have uh, to the maximum, you know what I mean? Instead of just paying a lot of money, you know what I mean? And, and really, that ain't really hustling, you know? So uh, it's kind of strategies, tactics, hacks, uh, and different uh, ways we found to eat good, because that's, that's number one. So, you want to start? Sure. All right, so we got, we got seven of these bad boys to share with y'all. And um, hopefully, some of this you may be already doing. Some of it might be a light bulb or, you know. And then you guys obviously know there's way more than seven ways to do anything. Um, so there's probably ones that we'll miss. And we'd love for you to, you know, send us an email or uh, let us know, you know, what you think should be on that list or, you know. What, what kind of techniques you've been using to make it happen. So the first, the first one, uh, the first slide is our first principle. And it's save scratch from scratch. And uh, bottom line, because I ain't trying to overword y'all, bottom line is cook more. And scratch means that, you don't get that, yeah. that, that was my non-GMO corniness. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's about cooking more, right? Um, anything that's already pre-packaged, pre-cooked, or whatever, we pay in markups on that. You know what I mean? So the, the, one of the first things when you uh, become uh, more interested in either plant-based lifestyle or just healthier in general, right, is Reconciling the fact that man, I gotta pay more attention to what I'm eating, and I gotta give more attention and time to cooking and making my own food, because I don't know what's in everything, right? So um, that's important, and um, and that saves money because you know they charge for pre-cooking things and packaging it and all of that. Uh, a lot of people say it's uh, health food is expensive, more expensive, but that's because we think health food is the packaged. Foods, you know what I mean? But true, the true essential health food is in the produce aisle. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it's got its own package, you know? And so that's the first uh, point that we can save scratch by cooking from scratch, you know? Um, and, and for people who feel like, you know, uh, but it takes too much time, we're going to get into that in another one of the points. But um, I want to give you guys uh, uh, this website is called Cooks smart or cooksmart.com excellent um tips on you know home cooking uh, that save time and, and, uh, and, and money and different things like that so they got a, a whole gang of resources and um another another important thing about uh saving money with cooking your own food is leftovers you know what i mean leftovers allows not to have to buy food when we go out you know what i mean just remix that bad boy for the next day. So, um, so Afia's gonna get a little bit more into it. Okay, I know, um, like he said, a lot of people say it's expensive to eat healthy, um, but then they'll just like go out to Domino's or McDonald's feeling like that is cheaper. We go to the next slide. Um, the slide here will show you that just for a Domino's medium pizza and Coke is $20. Right, and that's if you're eating one time or one serving. And then you have a Big Mac meal, a chicken um, nugget meal, and that's about $20 too. And that's one serving of food, it's meat. And some people will say it's cheaper to go to McDonald's right, than it is to eat something healthy. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that you can get all of this food for less money than one of those meals, right? And then we have like organic bananas, we got organic tofu, we got organic kale, 
and you can make at least two or three meals out of this and eat more than once, plus have snacks for the same price as you would if you had McDonald's or Domino's, which a lot of people would choose to do instead of just buying some food and eating organic and eating healthy. So that's kind of some cost comparison. So when people say, you know what, it costs too much, so I'm about to go to McDonald's, you know that you can get all this food for one McDonald's meal and eat at least four times plus have some good snacks. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. So, uh, all right. Let's get on to numero dos. Um, next slide. So, any any chefs in the building? Where you at? Where you at? <laughs> all right. All right. There's some little chefs, some young chefs. So, so all right. So, any? Let me ask you this. Uh, any French chefs or French cuisine chefs? I see one, so maybe one or two people that know what we're talking about for this second point. I want to, if you haven't heard of Mise en Place, I want to introduce that to you. Anybody ever heard of Mise en Place? Okay. All right, so in a, I'm going to give y'all the hood definition. <laughs> um, so Mise en Place is a, is a powerful, powerful concept that you know, it's a tradition that's popularizing French cuisine cooking, right? And it was, it was founded by this guy named Scobier, who, you know, he was a, a cook since 13, he was in the military, he was in prison, and all of this, and he learned all of these, these uh, regimented uh, type of practices for uh, efficiency in the kitchen. Right, you know, in the military, you got to feed thousands of people. It's a lot of stress, etc. Right, so he came up with something called that's now called the brigade system um, for for cooking in French kitchens, and then you know that's been franchised all around the world. But essentially, what it is is a a high level of organization and planning, right, in uh, in the flow of what happens in the kitchen, right. So, the interesting thing about that is that um, meat supplies can be applied to all, area, all kind of areas of life, not just the kitchen, um, in terms of how we approach planning and how much planning is a part of efficiency, right? So, um, meat supplies is something that the everyday person can bring to how we manage our households in terms of our kitchen. Um, in simple ways, you know, like we said, one of the resources in, in, in the hood beside money is time, is uh, the ability to be organized, you know. So Me Supplies is a, is a great philosophy that I encourage people to check out and see what you can take from it in, in our own personal organization. There's a, a great book I want to recommend before Afia gets into some specifics. And this book is called Work Clean by um, Dan Charnas. And it goes into uh, a lot of ways you can apply me supplies in everyday life and just save time, save stress, and just be more practical. Um, because when we can save time uh, and be more efficient, not wasting things, uh, we, we have a more sustainable lifestyle, you know, and it, and it saves money. You know what I mean? And it saves resources. And uh, so it's getting in the habit of that. So um, within the Beast and Plus is, is organization and planning. And one way to do that is basic meal planning. Um, they say you can spend 40% more money if you go to the store without a list than having a list. I know I can do that. I just go to the store and just start buying stuff. And I'm like, where did all this stuff come from? Because I didn't have my list. So. I just want to go over some basic meal planning techniques that will definitely help you to save money and time. So the first thing you want to do is to kind of make a list of your favorite meals that you can make without a recipe. So you want to have at least 7 to 14 meals that it's like, okay, I know I can make this and I don't need a recipe. So you can um, change those up within a week or two and you're not like scrambling trying to come up with something new. And I know I like to make new stuff, so if you want to make new stuff and want to be creative, the weekend is a good time to do that. Um, and the second thing is 
plan your meal around things that you already have. So whatever your favorite spices are, whatever your favorite grains are, things that you might have in your cabinet already is a great way to start your um, grocery list and then make meals around that um, as well. And then the next thing is use each recipe to inform the next. So what that means is say you have a recipe like coleslaw and you're only going to use half of uh, a head of cabbage for the next meal that you make. What are you going to use for the other half head of cabbage? You might make some curry, uh, cabbage, and potatoes to go with your next meal. So it's how to use everything that also will inform the next meal. And then the last thing is planning for leftovers, as you said before. So you want to cook big and save time and save money. I know I like to make at least three cups of rice when I make rice. And then I can use it for dinner that night, whether it be like rice to go with some soup, and then the next day or the next day and a half, I'll use it like to stir fry or something to have it for later. And I can also have it for lunch. I put a lot of our leftovers in my son's lunch or our lunch the next day. So making more food at one time, so that saves you time, and as well as it saves you for thinking about what you're going to make for the next day. So those are just some quick meal planning tips that you guys can use. Right on. And I, one other thing I wanted to say about planning, right, is uh, sometimes we have a fear of routine. You know, like, it's going to get boring, you know what I mean? Or I don't want to be so regimented in, you know, what I'm doing. And what I want to say, like, in the, in the Art of War, great book, Sun Tzu, classic, uh, the essential message in that book, uh, that militaries and business executives use to this day is uh, that planning wins the war. You know, execution of the plan, but the, the best planner, you know? And so, um, you know, we, we don't want to be in routines and patterns, but life is routines and patterns. Like, you know, whether we want to be in it or not, that's how life happens. And even when we don't think we are, we're doing the same things over and over and over. You know, so is the question is, are the patterns that we're uh, using working for us are not as much as they could be. And, it's, and just shifting our routines and patterns to something that gives us the results that we want. So that's how I like to look at the art of all and all aspects. Uh, one more point I forgot to make. So one thing I started doing was, like if I go to the grocery store and then still have like some veggies left that I haven't used yet, I take all of that out and I'll try to make that for my dinner that night. And it's still more like sometimes I have some broccoli left that I'm not gonna use in a day before it goes bad. I'll just quickly blanch it and throw it in the freezer and that's a way to keep it without wasting that and wasting money and then you can use it later for like some stir fry or some soup or something like that. So just quick blanch of some veggies that you know might be going bad in a day or so and you're not gonna get to it and throw it in the freezer and that's a great way to save some money. Right? Yep. Some plans make sense? Awesome. All right, so another way, number three, another way to eat good on a hood budget, one of my favorites is, what we got? <laughs> Soup it up. So for, if you like me, a non-cook, a non-chef, and you love food to taste good, and you want it fast and quick, you know, soup is the way to go, bro. You know, you put it all in the pot, and it seasons itself, you know, and you can make a big pot, and it's, it's filling and all that. So, you know, people who are new to healthier diets or whatnot, instead of, like, trying to find the, the veggie chips and things like that, you know, I'm always saying soups. You know, it's infinite variety. And um, simple, you know, you can use frozen vegetables, you know what I mean, some water, some spices, and bomb. So, right? Yeah. And then soup is also, besides just being quick and easy and inexpensive, it's very healthy for you. So we're about to come up on cold and flu season. And because vegetables have anti-inflammatory properties, um, it can actually help to break up a cold or a flu faster. 
um, and get rid of mucus. Um, it helps to regulate your weight. So I know sometimes people are working on losing weight. Soup is a great thing to add to your diet because it's so full of nutrients or really low in calories and so filling that it can help to regulate your weight as well. And um, the vitamins and nutrients in soup doesn't disappear. So when you're cooking it, all the nutrients and stuff are still within the soup and within the broth, so it's very healthy for you. So, um, did you want to say something? Yeah, just another little sidebar since we was on the French cuisine earlier. Um, how many of y'all know that restaurant is a French word? And, all right. And uh, it came from, in, in the French culture, it means a uh, place of restoration. And it got that name because in the Revolutionary War in France, they uh, would serve soups to uh, soldiers for healing and you know just not having a lot of resources you know soup is a way a go-to way in different cultures for people to get um, all the vitamins and be nourished you know and things like porridge and all of that so it's it, you know it's not nothing new um, that how powerful soups are for nutrition so yeah and if we can show the next slide real quick, I just want to go over some basic ways that you can add really good flavors to your soup. Um, so here are a few of my favorite herbs to add, basil, oregano, parsley, and rosemary. And the thing about these is you can do it dry, you can buy them dry. Um, or you can just have your own little herb garden in the window and have all of these available for you at any time. I know if I buy fresh herbs, they usually will go bad before I get a chance to use them. So growing them yourself, not only does that save money, it gives you fresh herbs to be able to use. And I have one honorable mention that I love for soup and a lot of stuff, my favorite spice right now is cardamom. And that's not a necessarily herb, but it's a spice. And all you have to do is add about three or four whole cardamom pods to any soup, whether it's coconut soup, a uh, split pea soup, a tomato soup, any kind of base, and you add the cardamom, and that adds such a bright citrusy flavor with just some salt and garlic, and that will just turn your soup game to a whole nother level. So I just want to say that because I love cardamom right now a lot. So. <laughs> David Blaine talking about it's just a little magic trick. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and you know, the cardamom paws are good in smoothies too. Yeah, they yeah. are. Um, okay, so. Let's turn up for number four. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is. Um, number four in our ways to eat good on a hood budget. So what we mean by that is about priorities, you know, and looking at, you know, what do we really value? You know, when we talk about what's expensive and what's not, you know, what do we really place the most value in? You know what I mean? You, a, a person can have a million dollars and be miserable because they're sick, you know? So money is one thing, but um, the internal organs is something else, you know? And um, so put your money where your mouth is, is, is about prioritizing health first. Right? Whatever it costs, you know, whatever the price, that's first, and then everything else comes after that. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times we have resources, but we spend on different things with cable and hairdos and Jordans and, you know what I mean, whatever it is, weed, whatever, whatever it is that, <laughs> You know, when it comes down to uh, that's true. Y'all know that's true. I'm just keeping it good, man. Um, but uh, you know, we, we spend money, you know what I mean, and then we be like, you know, that broccoli is high, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so what 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 I love about this one right here is her her frugality, right? And 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 ability to uh, maximize things, you know, and so you, you get more, you know, you, she, she shows us as a family, you know, how to see the value that we already have, you know, and how we use it, it's just the wisdom of how to use different things. And um, at the end of the day, you know, it's about having that 
system of awareness and accountability. So if we don't know where our money is going, you know, we just kind of, it's coming and going, then we, it's hard to budget and manage you know, or prioritize in the right kind of way. So Fia's going to give a, a practical way to kind of look at that so, you know, and we can put our money where our mouth is, which is health and wellness. Word up. So like he said, you know, we all have a list of like non-essential things that we have in our life, whether it be, like he said, some weed, or you might smoke cigarettes, or you might drink alcohol, you might get your hair and nails did every week, you might get your shop on on a regular basis. You got the highest extra channels, a thousand channels of cable you only be watching. Uh, video games, that's like $50, $60 a game. The freshest Jordans, all these things that it's like, what are small things that are not necessarily essential? Or like, I know a friend who's like tatted up, he got mad tats all over his face. Tats are like $100 or more a piece, right? So what are our non-essential, right? things that we have in our life that we have and then uh, say write a list of those things <laughs> how much do you spend on them and then say can I take 50% of that away and then put that towards even healthier just prior just prioritize you know what I'm saying so we're saying our internal health how we feel how we feel about ourselves how our families are going to feel it's more important to feel good than to have the newest toy. You know what I'm saying? Because that toy, kids gonna play with that for two seconds and that's, that's gonna be gone, you know? So finding those non-essentials and prioritizing about 50% or more, if possible, of that just to eat a little bit healthier. And that's what we do, like I cut off our cable, I'm not buying all them high-priced things for my son. He got to buy himself, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm kind of, like he said, frugal because I focus more on what we eat. So, so I just want to bring that back again, you know, slow it down, chop and screw it. <laughs> um, you said make a list, yes. right, of non-essential stuff mm -hmm. and and how much that costs, like yes. say per month or per yes. week. Mm -hmm. And then, if, let's say that number is $400. Yeah. Then you say, all right, I'm gonna take $200 out of that, mm -hmm. and that's gonna add to what I can get in a grocery store. Or, yes, that's gonna or, add gym to my, membership or whatever. Yep, organic. It's like I'm buying organic this month because I got an extra $200, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm buying a gym membership or I'm just spending more time with my family or whatever it is, you know, because health is more than just the food that you put in your mouth. You know, it's about how are you living your life? Are you happy? Um, do you have good relationships? Are you okay with your career, your education? You know, can you put that money towards learning a new skill? Just something to overall improve your life and your well-being. That's Pippin. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, so we're going to move to number five in our seven ways to eat good on a hood budget. And this is season your food. Right? And I ain't talking about salt and pepper this time. But season your food, though. Um, we're talking about eating seasonally. Right? So... Uh, eating, what that means really is eating what is in season, and it also will, by the nature of that, make you eat more local. You know what I mean? Um, there's a movement called uh, local board, which is, you know, people, you know, who eat locally and in season. And uh, how that saves money is because if, if something got to come from Taiwan that grows in January, you know, you already know, you gotta pay for all that time and distance and storage and, and who, who knows what else is preserving it for all that time, if it's a fresh vegetable. Um, and so, um, eat, eating seasonally and, and locally is ideal, you know what I mean? Um, if, if you can, you know. Um, also in um, traditional Chinese medicine, which is something that we subscribe to and feel like it's a great holistic alternative to conventional medicine, you learn about 
each season being uh, aligned with different healing that goes on inside the body. And, and different organs are uh, getting serviced or tune-ups in each season, right? So um, a few is going to get more into that uh, with you guys. Okay, so um, right now we're in the fall. So um, like he said, eating in the season, it helps because the foods that are in season at that time actually help to build your immune system for that time of year. So say we're about to be in the winter and citrus foods are in season during the winter. So this, you're gonna start seeing all your oranges and grapefruits and all of that. And even though you might see them all year round, their season is actually in the winter time, they're high in vitamin C. So that's gonna help your body to fight off colds and flus, right? So like uh, things like watermelon and melons are in season in the summertime because they have a high water content and that's gonna help to keep you cool in the summertime. That's why you're not trying to eat watermelon in the winter. Why are you gonna get cold? It's not gonna taste good. Why is it not tasting good? Because it's not in season, right? So that's one reason why you definitely wanna eat in season. Hold on right there, that's, ain't that powerful? <laughs> like nature just set it up, you know what I mean? Just like that. Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right, so we can go to the next slide. I'm just, uh, just have a list of fall foods. This is not even the whole list. And see, that's the thing. Sometimes we feel like if I'm only eating season, I'm not going to get certain foods. But there is such a whole host of foods that you can eat with every season. And not only does that help you to um, switch up you know, the same foods all the time, it just helps you to also increase your nutrients and have what you need for that time of year. So you're going to start seeing the apples and the pears and the figs and the grapes, you know, the dark leafy greens are in season right now. And this is just a small list, like I said, and we have the full list on our website in my fall detox. So, um, yeah, right now that's what's available. And another thing is that will help you to save money is this is a good time to buy organic. So you can start seeing, like when you start seeing the organic and the conventional things at the same price, um, then you know that thing is pretty much in season. Like the apples will be the same price as conventional. I know the broccoli is the same price and you'll start to see that at the farmer's market and wonder why is someone picking up the non-organic even though it's the same price or even the organic might be a little bit cheaper than the conventional, you know, and that's because it's in season. So. And, then, and you see there's a theme that we're building on too is seasons, patterns, routines, right? But I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> All right, so next slide, please. Another one of my favorite. Skip the middleman. Okay, so we're skipping the middleman. What we're basically talking about is avoiding all the extra markups, you know, that come because, you know, this super grocery chain, you know, has to make money for the logo and everything else they got. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, paycheck. Oh, paycheck. Oh, paycheck. Okay. Um, and stuff like that. So, um, and you know, you, you do things in moderation or do what you got to do. But uh, the idea, the principle is skipping the middleman and Afia is going to talk about three ways in which um, you know, that is an effective approach. She's going to talk, talk about the, um, the local community garden aspect, the co-op, and something called a CSA. So, um, let me just say, I shop at Whole Foods, I'm sure many of us do, just because they have some of the stuff that you can't find nowhere else, right? So yeah, sometimes you do. But I try to, at, more than anything, one, I try to grow my own food first. Um, we have a garden, and the great thing about it is that we live in Georgia, so you can grow food pretty much all year round. Like right now, you can be growing greens, you can be growing beets, radishes, carrots. Um, and if you don't, and herbs, um, and if you don't have like a place, uh, a big yard or something, you can always grow those things in pots on the patio or your porch or somewhere um, small. So first is grow your own food. That's a great way to skip the middle band and save money. Um, then there is a lot of local um, organic farms around here, so like True Living Well, 
Habesha. You know, there's a lot of places where you can actually go to the farm yourself. You can um, uh, you can uh, volunteer. You can learn, and then you can also get um, inexpensive produce from them. And then there are things like co-ops. Um, I know here we have like Seven Honda is a co-op where you can pay and you get um, you get discounts for food to have a membership. Um, when we lived in Brooklyn, there was a place called um, Seventh Street Co-op or something like that where you would have to work um, a certain amount of hours a month and you get really cheap produce and stuff. So co-ops are an option, or you can start your own co-op where you and just some friends get together and buy things in bulk and then you split it up that way. And then you can also learn, uh, join something called a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. So that's kind of like investing in a farmer or a farm. And you pay a certain amount um, up front before they even start growing stuff. And then you get a portion of everything that has been growing. So you're supporting them and you're giving them money up front to know that they can grow all this food. And then you get the benefits of getting those foods um, at a cheaper price, local and organic, to your home or you can pick it up there. And a lot of those have a sliding scale based off your income, or they'll take food stamps, or wherever you are in your um, monetary place, you can still get food that you can afford. Some of them double food stamps, thank you, see? There you go. So. Oh, and you can go to localharvest.com to find some CSAs in your area, to find some organic farms in your area as well. Localharvest.com? Yeah, so, as you said, um, it helps the grower, the local economy, and the grocery bill. So, uh, okay. So, and last, but not least, number seven, drink more water. And this is the drink water girl right here. Like, she sleeps with water. I <laughs> um, do. But I've learned a lot from that. And, um, you know, it's interesting, sugary, like, sodas and, and different kind of beverages like that are billions of dollars a year industry. Um, I want to, let me get this statistic, because this is crazy. Uh, the National Soft Drink Association said that it's $65 billion a year comes in from sodas and shit like that, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, now, now, let's break that down, right? So, they said that an uh, average American, one person, the average American, drinks 44 gallons per year. They ain't count me in that study. Yeah. They ain't me. Yeah, no, the people who drink oh. soda, they drink 44.7 um, gallons a year, right? And that just that in itself weighs 375 pounds, right? Now, that might sound like, oh, that's a year, that's all, you know? But if you if you break it down, it's that's like uh, $70 a month, first of all, on soda. And with, there's one other uh, statistic that I thought was crazy. Yeah, so that's like almost four gallons of soda a month, four gallons. Right. And you wonder why we have diabetes all over. Diabetes, obesity. Cancer. You know, uh, yeah, pancreatic cancer, all, all those kind of things are related. A lot of studies, too. And then and sugar being a drug in itself. So, uh, drinking water nips that in the bud. Um, saves money and health, we know this. Um, but, the, the fact is, you know, tap water is mad dirty, and then bottled water is mad expensive. That's like $11 billion a year industry. So, um, and it's crazy, like, the cost of tap water, and I'm reading y'all statistics, because this was blowing me away when I was doing some research, that a bottle of water is marked up 2,000 times more than the cost of tap water. You know what I mean? So, Basically, the message is get a filter. <laughs> She's going to take it from here. So, um, in general, you know, we should drink at least half our body weight in ounces of water a day. So if you weigh 150 pounds, that's what, 75 ounces of water a day, a minimum, right? If you work 
out. You should be drinking a little bit more than that. If you're breastfeeding, if you're pregnant, those kind of things, you should be drinking slightly more than that. And um, I could just say, these are great brands and stuff like that for water filters, but um, I would rather tell you what to look for so you can figure out which one you need for yourself because somebody wants something that goes, a picture that goes in the refrigerator, some people want stuff that goes on their sink. So there's these different standards that they have that you can look for to find the best water filter uh, that you're looking for. So the first one is NSF Standard 42 and NSF is the National Sanitation Foundation and they have these standards based off what um, the different filters are filtering. 42 is um, filters out the least, and, but this is like one of the most common ones and it will filter out things like chlorine, which will make things taste better, chlorine and fluoride, right? Um, NSF standard 53 will um, filter out things like lead or harmful bacteria, right? And then there's something really new, is NSF standard 41. And so what that removes is like the new um, herbicides and pesticides that are out, prescription drugs, um, things like lead and mercury and all that kind of stuff. So NSF 401 is the newest one and that filters out the most stuff. And um, so if you're looking for something, look for these numbers and then you'll know. And then you can also go to the NSF website nsf.com and they'll tell you like all every single thing that each one of these standards will filter out for you but some um, brands like aquasana um, is has that pure has a new filter that will filter out um, most of the stuff as well as whirlpool has some stuff for the refrigerator that will filter out some of that stuff as well and um, one good thing about living in georgia is we actually have some fresh springs here so we have um, Indian Springs. Has anyone here been to Indian Springs to get fresh water, spring water? A few people. So it's, it's down, I think it's the 75 South or 85 South. Um, and we went a few times. And the great thing is you pay $5 to get into the park. And you can take as many gallons and get as much water as you want. And it's fresh spring water. And it actually smells like sulfur when you first get it, which smells really bad. But sulfur is actually very good for you. And that's, if you've heard of MSM, and that's a nutrient that helps your joints and stuff, sulfur actually helps to make that in your body. So um, Indian Springs, you can go, you can get water, you just pay $5 to get into the park, and then you can get as much water as you want. And when we were there, there were so many people telling us how just drinking that water alone helped them cure them with cancer and just all these diseases that so many different people were coming saying that they were getting just from getting this water. And so that's a great way to get fresh spring water as well. And then if you um, actually leave the top off for a day or so, the sulfur smell will go away, but it will smell like sulfur when you first get it. Yeah. So yeah, um, to, to wrap it up, you know, like I said earlier, when we wrote this article, uh, you know, it, we had a, a great reception for it or whatnot, but there was some criticisms, and, um, and that's great, you know, because uh, we learn as we go. And one of the criticisms was uh, that there was a lack of information about the policies, you know, the, 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 the system itself, how it creates these vacuums and food deserts, and, you know, that we didn't address uh, that aspect. Uh, People also, you know, said that what about if, you know, there is no, you know, garden in my area, or, you know, the accessibility, the availability, you know. So those are uh, two things that are important and, and obviously matter uh, to whether or not we can actually eat good where we at. Um, and, and we recognize that. Um, but this talk is focused on the third aspect, which is culture. You know, there's policy there's access and then there's culture and tradition, you know, and, and that involves our individual choices, right, and our opportunities to take what we do have uh, and make the most out of that. So, um, you know, that's the, the focus of, of our talk, but we didn't want to not address that because that, you know, policy matters and, and accessibility definitely matters. Um, but overall, you know, in the whole talk, we, you know, the theme that we kept hitting on is routines and seasons and cycles and organizations and having rhythms, you know, and planning. 
And those are, you know, the valuable resources that we have, no matter how much money we got. You know, and we have to take advantage of those. So uh, we believe with that, we can eat good and keep the hood at the same time. <laughs> Thank y'all. All right. I'm sh if you have questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, they are willing to answer, and, and let's have some conversations. So I'm going to come down and hand the mic off. If you, do, if you do have a question, if you don't mind coming over here, right here, we'll queue up like during the last talk. Also, we still have our books and things for sale inside. Um, we're at the top of the hall, upstairs, on your right, in the right hallway. I have my cookbooks and our e plants with iron books as well. All right, just come over this way if you have a question. We got two right now. So thank you very much for being here. You guys have provided awesome information. Um, so I have a question for you, Snick. Um, did you notice any physiological changes besides healing your ankle once you switched over to a plant-based diet? Like emotionally, did you feel more available, or things like that? Yeah, yep, I definitely have and continue to. Um, I noticed more energy. I, I felt like um, eating a plant-based diet helped my spirituality grow. And I didn't, I wouldn't have connected the two, you know, before. But it, it I don't even know how that works, but you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, just, I noticed that I was more open. And, and, and seeing that effect of plants and healing myself, giving me more energy, made me uh, study more traditions and cultures that was advocating, you know, vegetarian lifestyle, like Buddhists and, you know, Rastas and, you know, different cultures, yogis and yoga. And it just made me respect it in a way. And, that, and those things have benefited my life tremendously also. So, I've been doing a lot of uh, research like with yoga and stuff like that, and I feel personally that introducing this lifestyle would help African Americans leaps and bounds advance in our country. Um, as far as accessibility, education, just taking better care of ourselves. So, um, being a black male, engaging in a vegan diet, like did you feel um, how should I say, you feel different energetically in terms of what you are open to? I know you said it was open to you spiritually, but did you feel more open and more compassionate with people that were adversarial, let's say, to you switching your diet? Does that make sense? And I would actually love uh, to hear from Afia about the same, same kind of question. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, just open in general, you know what I mean? This, when, you, when you're trained to think that eating is just, you know, cereal and hamburgers and whatever, you're not thinking about it. It's just taste and move on. And then one day you get hit with a realization that that matters to the quality of your life, right? It makes you say, well, what else am I taking for granted or not seeing, you know what I mean? Or just accepting as the, the tradition, you know? And you know, basically, you know what I mean? Like I've seen, and I'm, I'm not a, uh, a plant-based person who is like trying to say that's the way for everybody or like run around judging people like that. I'm more like mindfulness in eating, mindfulness in relationships, mindfulness uh, so that you're conscientious about what you're doing, you know, is is what, what I found very valuable. You know, like Native American, culture, indigenous First Nation people are not necessarily vegetarians, but they wasn't slaughtering animals and polluting the earth and all of this either. So there's ways that we can live in harmony with our ecosystem that may or may not be vegan, you know what I mean? But they definitely have to be sustainable. And it just made me more open to cultures that at least have that. But to, but to be clear, both of you are vegan, is that right? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because I want to make sure because we're being a festival. That's our message. So yeah, <laughs> just making yeah. sure we're all on message here. You know. Yeah. All right. And I get it because okay, I've been plant based for 26 years, and um, it can be really easy, at least when I was younger, to be judgmental. You know, for people who are not plant based, like I can't believe you're eating that, and you know. But at the end of the day, it's it's really a personal choice. Do you know what I'm saying? It is a personal choice, but it's a personal choice that is is for compassion, is for health, is for many different reasons people are brought to this lifestyle. And as a nutritionist, I've seen that, you know, it doesn't necessarily work for every single person, but that doesn't mean they can't be plant-based. That doesn't mean they can't eat more plants on their plate more than anything else. You know what I'm saying? Because plants are so healing and are so necessary. And sometimes even you can become a vegan and don't eat plants. You can just eat Oreos and drink soda. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't mean that you're healthy. You know, so it's more also about holistic health and how are you feeling internally overall. And we are here promoting a plant-based diet because that is really optimal for overall health. So I don't know if that makes sense too. Oh. Yeah. Hi, my name is Portia. I go to Clemson University and I'm a college vegan. Mm -hmm. And um, I really promote a plant-based lifestyle towards my community, or at least I try to, because in college, everybody thinks it's not cheap to be vegan, mm -hmm. but it really is. So since you are a mother and a father, and you do feed kids, I'm wondering what are some quick and easy meals if you're an on-the-go college student to just make up? Because I know some people in college don't even cook, so yeah. soup wouldn't even be an option unless it came in a can, and I don't like cans, so yeah. I'm just wondering if you guys could provide some tips or snacks. Mm -hmm. uh, well, something quick, well, do you have like a hot plate or anything, or what do you Oh, I got a stove, I live in that park. Okay, <laughs> tacos. <laughs> tacos are always very quick and easy, Casey are always quick and easy. Um, you can even do like a pasta salad with some um, frozen veggies, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, those are quick. And what my son will make for himself is, he's 15, he'll heat up some chickpeas and rice and put some coconut aminos on it and he's straight with that. You know what I'm saying? Um, hummus is really quick and easy. Uh, trail mix, granola bars, fruit. One of my favorite snacks is apples and peanut butter, apples and almond butter. So things like that. Um, are really quick and not expensive. You know, you can buy a whole bag of apples for $3 when they're in season and some peanut butter and that will get you through those snack times, so, yeah. I think three three pieces of equipment that are worth putting our money where our mouth is, is if in a college situation is a hot plate, a wok, and a blender. You know what I mean? Blend, you can throw anything in a wok, you know what I mean? It's gonna pop. And then, <laughs> Put anything, in, anything in the blender, it's gonna rock. <laughs> so that's a hot plate, a wok, and a blender. It is. College essentials. It is. All right. So we got two more right. questions. Okay. What I'm gonna ask of the two folks who have questions right here is that you be really concise with me, and you both state your question so they can hear both of the questions, and then they're gonna answer them both, and then we're gonna wrap up. And our next talk is in 30 minutes. It's David Carter. I think some people in here are excited to hear them as him as well. Um, so let's get these two questions, get them answered. And then if you have any other questions, if y'all will just conclude by saying where people can follow you on Instagram, Twitter, how can they get involved, how can they stay in touch? All right. Okay, I'll be quick. I am Cartag. I just want to say thank you very much for coming to speak here. I think uh, the information was very, Everyone. So I have a quick question, and it's something that I didn't hear you guys touch on that I feel that maybe some people would like to know. Um, when you first switched to a plant-based diet, I've been vegan for five years. Um, I know me personally, um, when you cut a lot of meat out of your diet, you do uh, get sick, or maybe you might go through some things and people will equate that to you not having enough nutrition or you don't have protein or it's because you're not eating meat anymore. So is there any detox, um, either drinks, smoothies, foods that you would recommend to those who are transitioning or haven't been vegan for that long? I actually have, a, um, we have a, a fall detox on our website right now. 
So it focuses on um, actually cleansing your lungs and your large intestine, but it focuses on food. So all of the detox that we have, we have seasonal detoxes on the site, are food-based. So it's not like you're just drinking. You're also eating because food can be cleansing and nourishing at the same time. And we also have herbs and things like that that you can do. But as far as when we first transition over, I think that you have to do the education to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, and um, my book, The Vegan Soul Food Guide to the Galaxy, is actually a guide to help you do it and help you be healthy because a lot of times you can take stuff out and then you don't add things back in. You're not eating balanced meals. Um, you're not even thinking about nutrition. It's just, I don't eat meat and I don't even know what I'm eating. You know what I'm saying? So making sure that you're adding in. You're eating a green vegetable with every single meal. Making sure if you're eating grains, sprouted grains are really good. Like your plate should be half vegetables, a fourth protein, and a fourth carbohydrate. So if you want to think of that in terms of like a balanced meal, that will help you to balance out your nutrients and not just like lose all this weight and start looking sick and people start saying you don't know what you're doing and you're not doing it right. So definitely doing the research to make sure you're getting in your nutrients and thinking of your plate, half vegetables, a fourth protein, and a fourth carbohydrate will help you to be balanced as well. All right, we did have that one other question, so let's get that one. So we, we are here at VegFest, and we always talk about like the aspects of, of being vegan and, and reasons to switch, right? You've got like health reasons, physical health reasons, you've got ethical reasons, you've got environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. But you guys add another aspect, which I think is it, you make it cool. You got, I mean, vegan, vegan is cool. I mean, that's, that's a legitimate another aspect, yeah. especially with the music, the workout album. It's a badass album. I mean, I, you know that type of. It, it makes you think. You make you make uh, thinking cool. You make you make um, spiritual health cool, and, and it breaks down the cult social constructs, right? Being vegan is for you know slender people that are you know converted, and are, you know like it's not uh, you know the, the mainstream. So, um, right. I mean, that's another. That's an act. That's activism, right? Part of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's powerful right there. Uh, is the integration of you know who we are with why we do what we do you know is 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 key for making it sustainable you know uh, a lot of times being a person of color or just different ethnic groups are like the invisible vegans you know what I mean like you know the mainstream shows one Eurocentric view one you know and they do that across the board, one type of beauty, one type of everything, right? So culture, like in, in communities of color, you don't, uh, cool is, is, cool is a, um, it's a currency, you know what I mean? Um, that different people, you just have, it don't have to be like me or nobody else, but just being yourself, being authentic. And we don't often see that in, when they talk about plant-based and healthy living. I mean, so we associate it with it must not be cool. You know what I'm saying? So I think my my goal, you know, for doing what I do is not to try to be cool, because that's how you don't be cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but but my goal is to be authentic. And my goal is to make um, healthy living relevant to my experience as a person. And, and show the common ground, you know, that different types of expression can have around the same issue. You know, there's some people who, I'll just say this and wrap it up, there's, even with the, like, the ethical versus the health, you know, it's always trying to pit one thing against the other. But, you know, we, we have to love animals, we have to love life, and we have to love ourselves. And, like, you wouldn't give, you wouldn't give your dog a Snickers. You, you know what I mean? Because that's not healthy for the dog. Because you care about animals, right? So you care about you, you know, in the same way. And, uh, you know, so that it's, it's just about integrating it with your, with your life and, and making vegan your own, making plant-based your own. And just one quick thing, being plant-based for so long, I've seen just the growth you know, of how it's becoming more popular in our society and people like DJ Khaled and Big Sean and, you know, people rapping about it and making it, like, cool, you know what I'm saying, matters. You know, those things matter 
and companies are trying to get into the pulse of the people, you know, by uh, utilizing people who are famous now and to get people to say, we should eat more plants. And some people hate on that, but I think that's great because that's how we get the youth and the next generation to come into more plant-based eating is by saying, let's get cows to do plants and Big Sean's talking about veganism and, you know, um, yeah, Mike Tyson and all these people, Beyonce and all these people who are going vegan and, and just being more plant-based matters, you know, and it's not about, let's, let's not hate on people who are doing that, let's embrace that because that's going to help the next generation come into this lifestyle too. All right, thank you all. How can we stay in touch? How can we learn more about what you're doing after the fest and, and, and keep this momentum going? So boom, um, website is rbgfitclub.com and we're on Instagram uh, with at rbgfitclub.com and individually um, stick rbg, afia, i-b-o-m-u, Ibomo. If you just go at a-f-y-a, I'll come up somewhere. So, you don't want to do my last name, at AFYA. I'm on all social media under that. I'll come up somewhere. Yeah, and we, we're working on a new project that we're super, super, super excited to launch the top of the year uh, to, you know, bring holistic practices in a fun way with all the funk and all the soul that we can. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all so much.